Hey guys, uh, so yeah, I'm going to be talking about how we built search at Slack, what are the uh, like intricacies there and what are the future things that uh, we see we want to invest in. And I basically, I'm in the search and discovery team here at Slack and uh, in my previous job I worked at Lucidworks and where I was doing search as well. So the quick a uh, summary of what I'm going to be talking about is I'm going to start off by talking a little bit about overall Slack architecture so that it kind of gets a sense as to how search uh, gets plugged into this flow of things. Then a little bit about the indexing side of things. How do we index data, the offline indexes, the online indexes, then something that uh, is called enterprise key management and how does that play with indexing some internationalization and localization efforts and how that played, uh, how search was playing a part in that. And then a little bit about the query side of things. So that's going to be my talk. A quick overall uh, summary of Slack, right? Like, so more than 10 million people log on to Slack on a daily basis. So l people create lots of message content, which means search is very interesting at Slack and how do we have people find things that they typed like last month, right? So that's basically what our mission and what we want to do. And Slack brings people, application and data. So what does that mean? Like, so people type in a lot of messages, they share files, they share links to tickets like Zendesk or Salesforce. So all of these data, we can make it searchable so that you can reference it in the future. And this is what the search UI looks like. So here's a few things that are slightly different from other search engines is each user has its own unique set of documents that they have searchable. Like you have channels that you talk in, you have private channels that some of y'all have access to, and you have DMs that you talk, chat with your coworkers. So every search is unique in that sense because you and your fellow coworker will have different access to different channels, which means results are not very durable, not very cacheable because they are different per user. And that also means we have no real head queries as such because it's like pretty unique in that sense. And for the first part, now we'll talk a little bit about how a message gets sent on Slack. And then we'll talk about how that flows into the search side of things. So this is like a simplified architecture of what happens when you type a message, right? So you type in a message, the message gets relayed to the API service, the API service fans it out to all other Slack clients that are connected to you. And once that's done, it's persisted in a database. Uh, so that is the flow of how a message gets sent out, right? Now, in this, what we want to talk about now is how does search play a part? So this is like a screenshot of how all, like, each green box represents a shard, but essentially this is all search indexes within Slack in some sense, where each column, what we are looking at is called a stripe. Uh, a stripe is basically a combination of a computed collection, which is basically a collection we built offline and a set of live collections, which are time partitioned on a daily basis. So we talk about seven days of live data and a computed index of everything before that, and how a stripe is basically a logical uh, concept on top of that to make search across all of it. Now, each Slack user gets rooted to one of these 64 slices uh, stripes out there. So it's hosting data for like multiple users, multiple teams co-locating them, and the stripe is spanning across multiple solar collections. Now, going back to the architecture and extending the Slack architecture, essentially, once we, we spoke about in the earlier slide how the message gets persisted, right? 
like after the message gets sent out to all other clients, the message also gets persisted. Now, right after that, what happens is the event, like a message sent event gets sent on the queue and the indexing queue essentially picks up that event, goes to the database and gets the raw message content again and uses that to index it into Solar. So our search indexes are backed by Solar and oops, I might have, yeah, sorry about that. Um, so once the message gets indexed into, so this is the overall architecture of how a message flows within the search infrastructure. Now, like I showed in the previous slide, uh, it's a combination of building an offline index and a set of live collections. So we'll talk a little bit about how we build each of them and why we do it in that sense. So building an offline index involves combining multiple small, multiple moving pieces and making the gluing them together because you're basically saying build every single message that was ever sent on Slack and have that tooling to be able to do so. So we it's think of it as a service that's similar to how you can index via MapReduce and tools out there like the MapReducer indexer tools. So tools similar to those and how you can build large indexes in a Hadoop cluster and then be able to send those uh, send these indexes over to the search cluster. Now, how does this work? It basically consists of three parts. So there's some, I keep pressing something, sorry. Um, it consists of three parts. We create something called composite dimensions, then there's a dog join, and then the last is a solar indexer stage. So we're gonna walk through each of these steps to show how the offline index gets built. Now, the first step in the process is called a composite dimensions job. Here, essentially, think of it, basically for search, we want all the data to be denormalized, right? Not only do we want the message that you send, all the reactions that people made to your message, which channel was it in, what was, like, was the file uploaded with the message? Was it a thread and did other people react to that? Uh, so we want to denormalize all this data. So essentially, in the composite dimensions job, all we're saying is build uh, in memory, uh, it takes data from all of these auxiliary tables, right? Like channels to convert internal channel IDs to channel names, similarly users, was there a file uploaded? And basically we partition them per team. So we take all this data and we partition all the data per team. And each team is then assigned to 122, 128 shards. So essentially we're building all the auxiliary tables which are like metadata to the actual message and we're building it into sharding it out by 128 and being able to create this and store this in memory so that when a message, when we're indexing messages, we can do direct translations to all the metadata for the message and be able to populate it with that. So essentially composite dimensions is just providing us a 360 degree view of all the events that took place on the message. And we are able to keep this in memory per team. Like, so we load up per team. Now, the second part of the stage is called the dog join, which is basically a thrift structure which combines the actual message with all of this data that was populated before. So which channels were the message typed in, which how many reactions were there on the message and things like that. So we, we basically take all these input messages, we know which team it belongs in, we combine it with the team's composite dimension that we had built up earlier, and we basically able to pro create one solar input document at the very end of this step. So at the end of these steps, uh, we have built solar input documents 
or, or in a thrift structure which is not indexed but the raw data has been generated so this runs as the first phase of the map reduce process right so we are able to now create all the messages out there now what we basically take is we on each message we then shard it and then on we create these shards in another map reducer uh, in the reducer phase of the operation so basically we spin up a solar embedded solar and we are able to create each shard at each reducer right so it basically takes this dog join thrift structure and it's using emr and it's basically outputting at the very end a solar core which is basically a solar shard at the very end of this process so this is the three steps that we kind of built to have the ability to index messages offline. And once these indexes are built, we basically uh, push them to S3 and then the solar query, uh, the solar active servers are able to download the indexes of S3. So this is the indexing process. Now going back to the same stripes that I had showed you earlier, right? You can see that the number of green dots in this section of it is varies in size. That's because when we're computing this index offline, you know per team or per stripe, how many documents are there gonna be? So the number of shards that we create is based on the number of documents that are there. So we can dynamically calculate how many shards should each collection have while building these step while building this offline so at this point we build an index offline and on top of this index we will now be able to interlay seven live collections or seven like time based partitions and index any new data that comes in and overlay them on top. And then we can do the same process over and over again. So a few advantages of building a very extensive offline system like this is you can make schema changes very easily. You can re-index with different field types. You can upgrade solar versions like all of these start becoming very straightforward if you have a vast uh, like if you have a tool like this to be able to index every single message like i said it's it's not easy sometimes because a lot of it has downstream dependencies on is this data available to us how is data is will this data bring down my mysql shards because like you're just reading too much from mysql so in our case, we build backups of MySQL uh, and that gets uploaded to S3 so we can read off a uh, offline database, some, something like that. And so we are able to build this up. Now, this was like the essential flow behind how indexing works. And now we're gonna talk a little bit about what are the few features that uh, Slack provides and how does that affect indexing? So there's a feature called enterprise key management where basically customers control the key used to encrypt their data. Any customer's search index lives on an encrypted file system, right? So each customer's search index also needs to be built separately from everyone else's because that data is encrypted, they sit on a different file system. So what does that mean? That they get individual stripes now. So each EKM user has their own stripes, which means if you have like thousands of such users, you can now have thousands and tens of thousands of solar collections in the same cluster. So that Propose like that hosts its own set of challenges and how does the cluster scale when you have thousands of collections out there. And even the indexer, the offline indexing needs to be running separately from everyone else's. So it's like it involved some more tooling on our side to allow something like this to work with search. Next up, I'll talk a little bit about the internationalization and localization and 
how do we deal with people typing messages in different languages and how do you search for message when a user might type in a certain language but is looking for messages across everybody typing within slack right so uh analogy here is localization is the equivalent of like say having a blog post in different languages right so you can have an english variant a spanish variant a french variant but internationalization is having the correct blog post served to you based on knowing where the user is coming from <clears throat> what their language is so what are the languages <clears throat> that are, are currently supported right so you can have german uk english us english and a set of like eight languages that we natively support and all of these are configurable within two options so every time you create a workspace or a team within slack the administrator can set the default locale right <clears throat> the second option is your user preference so you can go in user preferences and select your locale that you uh, are going to use so we want to use both of these and both of this information to be able to index the message correctly so now let's say if the workspace preference is in english but there is like the user is in speaking in spanish right so like how does this how would this work right so a user types in a message in spanish and oops, that did not get rendered uh, okay these two were supposed to be like how messages look like in different languages but essentially what we do is like whenever a user types in a message their locale which in this case was spanish gets indexed into a spanish search field and since the team workspace was english we also index it within the english work uh, uh, language field and what happens when we search right okay this is give me a second sorry about that Yeah, it's loading better now, right? It's weird. Um, cool. Okay. Um, <clears throat> that was. Give me a second. I don't know. Sorry. <laughs> it was showing up okay, right? All right, yeah, this renders much better, right? Okay, so essentially, like going back to the example, like since the workspace preference was English, this is how the message got indexed, and the Spanish variant gets indexed with the Spanish field. So, what happens when we do a search? Essentially, at search time, 
we have to search across all the search or all the language fields because we don't really understand where the user is searching and what he could like that person could be searching for a message that could be typed by somebody else in say French, right? So at search time, you kind of have to search across all of the fields and like different fields be like tokenized differently, stem differently based on how the language uh, semantics works, right? So in this case, since we're searching across all the fields and in the example, I'm kind of just showing you English and Spanish, essentially the query term gets matched within the Spanish field because uh, the word gets stemmed and then the stemmed form matches the Spanish field. But since the English field does not stem the word, it doesn't match, in this case, the English field. So in this case, we get a match on the Spanish field. And when we search, we essentially match and then we show you the highlighted term there, right? So because of this strategy, what are uh, the potential improvements that we could make here, right? Like if we can detect the message upfront and instead of relying on the language preference of the team or the user's language, what we could do is have smarter tokenization strategies within Lucene, where we could have one, to one field, but have different messages get tokenized differently so that at search time, we only search across one field. So that would be like something that we wanna explore in the coming months. And at, we could also try detecting the language at query time if we don't do the smarter tokenization strategy. So we want to see and explore, can we do something better rather than searching all the fields and hoping they get matched in one of them versus like having a smarter way to do so. Now, those were fields that were like non, uh, were Indo-European languages. Now for CJK, we do things a little different because CJK, essentially we can, we have libraries that can detect that this message has been typed in CJK. So we don't merely rely uh, on like the workspace and the user pre local preferences. We can also, since we can detect the CJK characters. So when we type in something in Japanese, essentially we index it into a couple of search fields because we know that this message has been typed in CGK. Uh, so we index it into a Japanese field and like CGK3 and like both of them have different tokenization behaviors and they are able to match the search index. And so like there are two types of language analysis we do for CJK, we detect the languages and for all the Indo-European languages, we kind of rely on preferences out there to index it. Last up is the query architecture, right? Now we talked a little bit about the localization efforts and all of how the message gets indexed. Overall, how does this stack up, right? So we have the backend search infra, like the backend where all of Slack is written in and then we have a search proxy in front of it. And in front of that, we have the solar services. So when we talk about the backend, the web application, essentially that's written in Hack, which is a programming language, uh, like PHP variant programming languages. And a lot of application code of search is also written there because we need to translate for that user, what are the channels that they have access to? What are the conversations they have access to? What are the channel? When you type in a message like this, we need to be able to look up that user's uh, internal IDs, where the channel belongs in, and be able to translate all of that. So all of that happens in the backend search infrastructure. And then those get sent over to the search proxy layer. The search proxy is like a layer written in Java, which interacts with solar using solar J proxy. Now the search proxy has like a few, uh, like it plays a few role, like it does a few things there. Essentially, now that we have all of, 
like the filter queries and like the ACLs correctly send from the web application, it can now do a little bit on the query rewriting side of things. So it can do some detection there, add synonyms, things like that, and then send it to search. And when we get back search results, essentially we can do re-ranking within the proxy layer. So the proxy layer kind of doubles up as a re-ranking layer, layer for us as well. So we get back like OV overfetch search results from solar and then do the re-ranking within the proxy layer. Now, while building like a proxy layer, like a few things that we found out and like people should uh, know about is when you're writing a proxy layer, like say in Java or any other language, essentially what you want to make sure you can control is say if you have a few bad or a few slow solar machines out there, the proxy layer should not be holding up all, the con all of the connections that it can make against only those machines resulting in the proxy not being to serve traffic to the rest of the solar servers. So imagine like a bad solar server, which is like the, say the AWS machine has, is in a bad state or something like that, but all the connections go there and it's like just a black hole where like connections are being taken up and the, like the search requests aren't being processed essentially. Now, say if you have like hundreds of uh, thousands of connections to that machine being made because a lot of searches are there, what happens in the proxy layer, right? All those requests get held up. And at that point, like it cannot serve requests to other machines. So you want to make sure that the proxy layer is aware of say a per collection basis, or it knows it has some concepts of limiting requests and mitigating requests only so that a few bad solar nodes cannot, uh, affect the remaining solar nodes. And we are gonna talk a little bit um, like, so this is like the overall proxy service that we have. We like at some point we'll talk more details as to how do we do re-ranking there? What are the pros? What are the cons of doing query rewriting at that stage versus doing it within solar and things like that. Uh, and we're gonna dive later in some other talk about that. So this was like kind of the overall architecture of what we do. So if you guys have questions, um, uh, please free to ask. Yeah. Hi, I was wondering um, when you're searching over the fields for multiple languages, do you do any like stemming or any kind of analysis on the search term? How do you do that? So, so the way it works is because like, so every field type has its own set of stemmers. So I've abstracted, like I've just called it stemmer filter, but like a different field type will have a different stemmer with a different language attached to it. So essentially that message has been indexed with that sort of tokenization and stemming involved. So at search time, how the query parser, so when a query parser takes in a message, it for per field essentially stems it according to the same language. So the same query term is now being analyzed differently of different fields when matching it. If that makes sense, yeah. Uh, uh, I was wondering like, uh, why is the CJK uh, indexing flow yeah. quite different to the other European languages? Because they are just another language. So right now we do CGK differently because we have the ability to detect CJK upfront. So like whenever, even if say the user's locale is English, but he types in a message in Japanese, you can, we are able to detect that that's Japanese essentially. So because of that, we know that we can index it into the Japanese field essentially, but we don't have the, we don't really do that for like say in like, Spanish or something like that, or somebody types in, in Swe like, an any other language. So are you detecting on the non-Latin alphabets? 
uh, we detect for CGK specifically. So we say if this message is CGK, then index it like that. Otherwise, rely on the preferences. So yeah, the other, yeah. Yeah. The other potential improvement which you are uh, suggesting for non-CGK languages is to detect in the same way as CGK. Yes. And then eventually, like, and we'll only find out when we start actually working on this. But like, my hope is all of this, if we detect it at index time, we can even index it into one search field so that different languages get tokenized differently, but they all land up in the search search field. And so that you're not searching multiple fields and paying the cost for that as well. Um, do you have a problem when one word have different meanings in different languages and then it, we do actually yeah. yeah like because in a lot of cases like you can do the wrong you can still find a false positive match because it means something else but because the tokenization matches uh, it doesn't mean that it's actually finding the right thing how, how do you solve that problem? Uh, we like we're still looking at ways to improve that yeah Yeah, um, I was just wondering how you handle actually the cost of doing a long date range search when, when it comes, if I have kind of like a 24 month archive, right? how do you keep it from being really expensive and having kind of the year ago's data being online? And being so that's a good point. So basically, if... So every time you search, uh, like you have an option between recent and relevant search. So basically, like we f we are able, like by default it's a relevant search. So that means we can like search in the lives and then like prioritize the older messages based on that and uh, score them differently as well. While recent still has to like still search across everything, so we don't really do much around like short circuiting queries. Like if we find enough hits beyond a certain range, uh, as of now we've not really hit that problem. To be honest, like like a lot of like search the search system seems to be holding up fine without that. So we'll get to it when it kind of becomes more prominent. Any more questions? Uh, my question might be a little beyond your uh, presentation, but uh, do you have some, or do you think about some personalization for your search? I'm sure, like, so, like, there was a talk recently uh, that another co-worker of mine did where he talked about personalization in context to uh, how we can do that with keeping messages uh, secure, like, so, like, the trick there, I guess, is f like we can't like every team is unique because the data belongs to them. And then even within each Slack team, like different users might type different messages that different users don't have access to. So uh, there was a talk based on how do we uh, index say only public content from that team to be able to do like at least some user behavior and stuff like that. So maybe check like that's that should be a good starting point, I'd say. Any more questions? No? Okay, so uh, thank you very much for your talk, Varun, and thank give you. him a round of applause. <laughs>